We chanted Mantra Om. I would like to briefly mention the meaning of the word and the Mantra Om. The word Om we call in India the Seed Mantra, the Bija Mantra, Seed Mantra. So out of this one mantra, all other mantras emerge. And not only all other mantras, but all other words, the entire language of Sanskrit. And perhaps some would say not only Sanskrit, but all languages of the world emerge from this fundamental one seed sound. The word Om is related to the same as Amen. So be it. So whatever is in the universe, we say Om. So be it. We understand the universe and we accept it as it is. That total acceptance, that is what I call love. Love is the total acceptance of the other as the other is. And so when you accept the universe, and don't try to mess it up, <laughs> then you are in love with the universe. And then also the same root is related to uh, omnipresent, Omnipotent, omniscient, all these words, omni, come from the same root, which means totality, the wholeness. So the universality and the totality, the wholeness, is embedded in this one beautiful word, Om. And it's a very simple mantra. Any time when you are walking, you can just say, Om Shanti, Om Shanti, Om Shanti. You can say Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. And the Shanti mantra means peace. Now, in Western linguistic meaning, when we say peace, generally people think of peace as absence of war. But in Shanti, the meaning of peace in Shanti is more than absence of war. It is presence of harmony, presence of wholeness, and presence of calmness. When you are at ease with yourself, and when you are at ease with each other, and when you are at ease with life and with the universe, then you are in the state of Shanti. And we say Shanti word three times. So first of all, we say, I am at ease with myself. I make peace with myself. Quite often, we are not at ease with ourselves. Quite often, we are at war against ourselves. Quite often, we condemn ourselves. We say, I'm not good. I want this. I want that. I'm not happy. I can't do this. I can't do that. So we underrate, undervalue, and undermine ourselves. And that causes tension, stress, conflict, frustration, disappointment, and even depression. And so the first word, when you say Shanti, I make peace with myself. I am at ease with myself. What in Buddhist terminology we would call calm abiding. Abiding is like abode, your abode, your house. So living in your house is abiding. Where is your house? Your house is 
in your body. And you are calm in your body. You are calm and at ease and in harmony with yourself. That is the first time we say Shanti. But then our home is not only our body. Our home and our relations and our family extends to a whole of humanity. From your blood family, to your village family, to your uh, regional family, to your national family, to the family of humanity. The entire humanity is one family. And therefore, all these distinctions, such as you are English, I am Indian, you are Russian, I am American, you are Chinese, I am Japanese, all these distinctions. You are Buddhist, I am a Hindu, you are a Christian, I am a Jew, you are a Muslim, I am a Sikh. Whatever the divisions are, or you are a communist, I am a capitalist, whatever distinctions you make, all these divisions are narrow divisions. And they create war. These divisions, separations create conflict. Therefore, we say second time, Shanti. I am at ease with entire humanity. Whatever you are, you may be um, Russian or American or Chinese or Japanese or African or whoever you are, Hindu or Buddhist or Christian or Jew or Muslim, whoever you are, black or white, rich or poor, whoever you are, I make peace with you. One humanity, calm abiding, living with that calmness, with that harmony, with that ease, no burden, no conflict on your shoulders. So once you have made that peace with humanity, then you make a further extension and you go into the cosmos. We are, humanity at present time is at war against nature. The way we treat the animals in our factory farms as if they are creatures, they are enemies, we imprison them, we torture them. The way we treat our soil will poison it with fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides and so many poisonous things. And we kill all the worms and, and insects and, and, and earthworms of the soil and put chemicals and poisonous fertilizers and put heavy machinery on the soil. We don't treat nature in a friendly manner. And so the third time we say make peace, Shanti, we make peace with cosmos. We make peace with the rain and the sun and the soil and the animals and the forest and the birds. They are our family. In Sanskrit we say, Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam. The entire earth is your community. The earth community, the planet home. Your home is not only where your bedroom is, your bathroom is, your garden is, your kitchen is. That is your home. But that's only an intimate home. But the ultimate home, the earth home, the planet home, the cosmic home. Expand your mind, expand your consciousness and make the entire cosmos your home. And be at ease with itself. Be at ease with cosmos. And when you can reach that consciousness, expansive, generous, the generosity of spirit that was mentioned. If that generosity you can embody, then you have made the third piece. And therefore, it's a very beautiful mantra in these three words, actually only one word, but uh, chanting it or announcing it or pronouncing it three times, you have embraced the entire cosmos starting from your intimate body with yourself to the ultimate, from intimate to ultimate, the entire cosmos. So these are the, this is a kind of beautiful trinity. My book and the title of this talk, Soil, Soul, Society, is embedded in these three words, peace. 
when we make peace with soil and we make peace with the soul and we make peace with the society, then soil, soul and society. Soil for me is a representative of the whole cosmos. We stand not on the earth, but we stand on the soil. We are made of soil. All our food is made of soil. All our houses are made of soil. If there's no soil, there's no life. But we completely forget. We think that dirt is dirty. But dirt is not dirty. Dirt is sacred. You say, wash your hands, dirt is dirty. Dirt is not dirty. So when the, we have seen the sacred quality of the earth, and we have realized our dependence on the soil, and when we are able to take care of the soil, and see soil not as something dead, something inanimate, but something living, the soil, and which represents for me nature, is alive. The earth is alive. Nature is intelligent. Trees are intelligent. Soil is intelligent. And what a wonderful soil that we have. So generous that if you put one seed into the soil, that soil, mother soil, will give birth to a tree. And that tree, taking all the nourishment from the soil, will become a huge tree with big trunk, branches, thousands or tens of thousands of leaves, and then in due course, beautiful blossoms, colorful blossoms, pink and red and white and many, many other colors. And out of that, those blossoms, that mother soil is giving you that nourishment that out of those blossoms come the fruit. Your apples, your oranges, your mangoes. And from that one seed, the generosity of the mother earth, the mother soil, that one seed, how many apples do you get from that one tree? Every year. For 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, that one tree will give you thousands upon thousands of apples. And when you go to a tree, an apple tree, because I'm an orchard keeper, my wife June, who is here, and we have in North Devon, 15 apple trees. And we witness this every day, the generosity of the spirit that you talked about. We can learn generosity of spirit from that apple tree. And it's working hard from April blossoms to September, October fruit, working for months and months and months to make those fruit juicy and sweet and delicious and nourishing and nurturing. That is mother soil for you. Please don't forget mother soil. Without that mother soil, you will have no the, those Devonshire delicious, juicy, fragrant apples. And when you go to the apple tree, it never asks you, have you come with a visa card? <laughs> generosity of the apple tree. Unlimited generosity. Unconditional generosity. Unlimited love. Unconditional love coming out of that soil and the soil transforming itself into that apple tree or mango tree or orange tree or oak tree or ash tree or whatever tree you can multiply the metaphor. And so it is so generous that it gives and gives and gives to anyone who comes and does not make any discrimination. It does not say you are black or white, you are Indian or American, Russian or Chinese, you are Hindu or Muslim, Buddhist or Christian, you are black or white, you are rich or poor, you are educated or uneducated, you are Oxford graduate or uneducated Satish, 
whoever you are, I am an educator. I've never gone to university. I have never gone to school. I've learned all what I have learned from the university of life. So I call myself uneducated. <laughs> Educated are the problems. <laughs> <laughs> the problems of the world are created not by uneducated peasants. It's by graduates of Oxford and Cambridge <laughs> and Harvard and Yale and big, big other universities of the world. Who causes war? Iraq war. Who caused the Iraq war? Blair and Bush, one from Oxford and the other from Yale. <laughs> <laughs> so the apple tree makes no distinction, no discrimination. Generosity and love, undiscriminate, unlimited, unconditional. This is why I love soil. And I want you to start to love the soil. And when we can love the soil and we can love the earth, and we can love all the things which come out of the soil, we will be enlightened. You don't need to go to a temple. You don't need to go to a church, to a mosque, to learn unconditional love. You don't even need to read great books, how beautiful they are, the Bible, the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, uh, all the Tao, Tao De Ching, all the great books which I love. They are wonderful books, but the real book of nature, is the real book, the book of revelation. The real book of love is nature. That apple tree tells you love yourself and love others as I love myself. Tree loves itself. Tree loves, what a glorious tree stands there in the April um, blossom and stands there beautifully through the summer and through the, 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 the autumn giving all the fruit and even in the winter, it stands there waiting for the spring to come and all that enduring energy and, 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 uh, and accepting and receiving and standing up to that winter, cold winter, windy winter. And when again spring comes and the summer comes and the autumn comes and the humility of the tree, humility of the tree, the branches go down when more apples are on the branch, lower the branches are. They bend. They don't break. That we can learn. We think bending is not good. Humility, I mean, we are very arrogant. We don't want to bend. But we learn from the tree that's good to bend. And if you are a living entity, a living being, then you, are, you, are, you bend and you don't break. A living branch bends and does not break, but the dead branch breaks. And therefore, living quality that we can learn is quality of humility, of bending. So this is my idea of soil, sacred soil. You can read more in my book, but just briefly. And then soul. We remember, we are soulful. We are not just body. Body without soul is only good for coffin. <laughs> so soulful. But how much time we give to our soulfulness? Every day, day after day, day and night, we take care of body. We feed it. We wash it. We clothe it. We work hard to get things for the body. But how much time do you spend to take care of the soul? And the taking care of the soul is to develop those soul qualities. With your body qualities, you can see, you can taste, you can hear, you can touch, you can embrace. These are wonderful qualities. We are grateful. We have to be full of gratitude for this gift of body. This beautiful, wonderful, mysterious, magical body that we can look at beautiful things and taste beautiful food. Although food is, has a function to keep our body together. Food gives us vitamins and minerals and protein and all the other nourishment that you need. But it gives you more than that. It gives you delight. 
it gives you pleasure. So what a great gift there is that we can combine delight and pleasure and joy with functionality. So it's a wonderful body. But within this body, and actually, in my view, body and soul are not separate. It's only in the language that we differentiate. Body and soul are one. There's non-dualistic view of life. And in non-dualistic view, there's no separation. Body and soul are one. But in our language, we explain that the soul qualities are the qualities I mentioned in nature of generosity, of love, of compassion. All those qualities need to be developed. And also, in the soil of the soul, there are weeds. Like in a garden, there are weeds. And if you are a gardener, then you try to minimize the weed without hating them. I and June, we have been gardening in our North Devon home for the last 35 years. And every year, we plant and we go in the garden and weeds are coming. No problem. We'll weed them. Thank you, weeds coming. Thank you. You are giving us opportunity to weed. Otherwise, what will we do? <laughs> no work. <coughs> Weeds keep us busy. Weed give us opportunity. They are a good opportunity to be engaged with the garden. It will be boring if automatically all the fruit and flower grew and we had to do nothing. That would be boring. There is no creativity in the garden if you don't have to weed. There is no imagination. There is no poetry. Poetry is to make poes, poesis. Poetry, the word poetry is not just the beautiful words on a page. Poesis and poetry means to make. Art is also. Art is not only a painting or a dance or a piece of music or um, a sculpture. Art means to make, artificial, artistic, to make by hand. And so garden becomes a poetry when you weed and you plant and you, um, you water and you work on it like you work on a painting. And so weeds are fine. So in the same way, in the soil of the soul, there are weeds, our doubts our fears, our meanness, our anger. And don't, don't worry about them. Just like in a garden, happily you weed them out. When you are a bit angry, see it as a weed and take it out. <laughs> Easy. If you can weed your garden, why can't you weed your soul? And so, a good gardener will maximize the flowers and the fruit and the vegetables and minimize the weeds, the docks and the nettles. They are also useful. Even a little bit of anger is useful in its place. A little bit of fear is useful in its place because we are humans. Like a garden, we are humans. And we have to embrace our humanity with all its imperfections and perfections. With all its beauty and its warts. Warts and all. And so, we take care of our soul. And when we are in love with soil and taking care of the soul, and we are full of generosity and love like beautiful flowers, and beautiful fruit, and beautiful vegetables, and beautiful herbs. And those things are like love, and compassion, and generosity. Then you are able to take care of society. All beings, human beings, they need help. I need help. And I'm always helped. I'm always given support. And therefore, to the best of my ability, I give back some help. We live in the world of mutuality. 
We don't live in the world of isolation. We live in the world of reciprocity. We don't live in the world of disconnection or separation. And so if we take care of each other, all human beings, whoever you are, old, young, handicapped, ill, sick, poor, whoever you are, you are a human being. We don't judge. That's a society. That's a, Mrs. Thatcher said, there's no such thing as society. Can you be yourself without anybody? Can you be without your mother in this world? She carried you for nine months in her, her womb. And there is no such thing as society. Can you, can you be Mrs. Thatcher without going to school? Forget your teachers if there's no such thing as society. Forget your, all the other teachers who have taught you your English language and your culture and your science. We are members of a huge humankind, human society. And so in our best of ability, we give our support and our help. And if we give with generosity, like apples give generosity of apples, we give generosity of our service to each other, then everybody's looked after. Everybody's looked after. Mutuality and reciprocity are the guiding principles of the universe. The universe works on mutuality and reciprocity. So if we can do that, then I think soil, soul, society. These three words can remind us our true place. And in that, we can be at ease. Shanti, Shanti, Shanti can be at ease with soil, at ease with soul, and at ease with society. So these mantras help. This meditation helps. But mantras and meditation have to be put in life, practice. It's no good just every morning sitting half an hour, eyes closed, chanting mantra. And then, this is why I say, the, the meditation is not only when you sit down for half an hour in the morning or evening. Meditation is a way of life. Meditation is 24 hours. I am in meditation at this moment, speaking to you. My full presence is here. I'm totally here with you. And what a great joy and pleasure to have this wonderful company here. So every moment, if you celebrate, you are in meditation. That mindfulness, that awareness, that awakeness. The Buddhahood is to be awake. An enlightenment is to be awake. Awakeness of this beauty, the wonder, the joy, the bliss of the universe, of our planet Earth, of our country, Britain, England, Devon. How blessed we are that we are in Devon. What a beautiful country, county it is. Today, my group, whom uh, we are working together at Schumacher College, we went to Dartmoor, Wisman's Wood. What a wonderful day we had, walking on this wonderful, glorious, open moor. What a great gift. Can you afford not to be grateful and joyful and blissful on that moor? And can you imagine Devon with that moor? How blessed we are. So celebrate every moment and you are in meditation. And the moment you start to complain, weather is not good and Dartmoor is not good and um, there are ticks there and some, something else is going wrong and you are not in meditation. You are in complaining. <laughs> nature, nature never complains. Honey bee goes from flower to flower, taking, honey, taking nectar from each flower. A little nectar here, a little nectar there. In such a way that never ever a flower complains. So honey bee and the flowers are in constant meditation, in constant relationship of love, of reciprocity, of mutuality. So if we can learn from nature, and then we can learn from people, from each other, 
celebrate the beauty and generosity and the uniqueness of each and every individual. Every and each individual is special. No one is superfluous. No one is unnecessary. Each and every one of you and me and all of us are unique. Recognize your uniqueness. Recognize your speciality. Recognize your gift. And then, when you recognize your gift, you will know that you are a poet. You are an artist. Look at your inner artist, your inner, inner poet, your inner guru. Guru is not somewhere, somebody out there. The guru out there is only a guide to find your inner guru. And then you will find your potential is so enormous, so enormous that you can be potentially a Buddha yourself. You can be, or you are potentially a Jesus, a Shakespeare, a Mahatma Gandhi, a Mother Teresa, an Aung San Suu Kyi, Bengali Mathai, these wonderful women and men. They are all because they realize their potential. Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela, Beethoven and Bach, Picasso and Monet, and Van Gogh, and many, 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 many thousands and thousands of people whom you know and don't know. The heroes and unsung heroes. Although I'm not too keen on hero metaphor, although I like Joseph Campbell's hero journey, but my metaphor, and we are running this course here, is called Earth Pilgrim. So my metaphor is pilgrim. We are all pilgrims. Pilgrims of life. And every pilgrim is special. There is a, a saying from Ananda Kumara Swami, a great Indian philosopher, called, um, it is, uh, he said that an artist is not a special kind of person, but every person is a special kind of artist. You are all artists, special kind of artists. We are all artists here. Find your artist rather than this depression and conflict and I'm no good and I can't do this and I can't do that and I'm frustrated and I can't find my way out. Find your inner artist. You are a special artist. That is soul quality. So if we can embrace this soil, soul society, shanti, 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 then I think we can live a joyful life. And even when there is some difficulty, even when there are some problems, even when there are some mistakes, there are weeds. Embrace them. <laughs> Embrace them. Difficulties are good for us. Problems are good for us. They are weeds. They give us opportunity to resolve them, to solve them, to be creative, to be imaginative. I have this challenge. I have this problem. How am I going to solve it? What a great opportunity. You have no problem to solve, no experience. And no experience, no resilience. Only through experience, you get resilience. And, and only through experience, you build character. When a, like the old postern here has a character. Why? Because it has gone through weather and, and conditions and the snow and the rain for hundreds of years. Therefore, you say, oh, house has a character. The new house, you build lots of money and lots of glass and lots of this and that, has no character. It has to go through difficulties. It has to go through weather, through snow and rain and, and ages and repairs and oldness. So knowledge alone is not enough. Knowledge must be married with experience. And when knowledge and experience meet together, then wisdom is born. Knowledge is, you can say, science. Science is knowledge. And experience is religious experience, spiritual experience, experience of relationship, experience of falling in love, experience of being compassionate and, and, and moved by compassion to see someone ill, somebody in need, somebody fallen, somebody, oh, I feel your pain. Can I help you? That's a religious, spiritual experience. 
And when knowledge and experience come together, when science and spirituality come together, then wisdom and humanity are born. And therefore, I feel that for our time, we need this very holistic vision. And this, these three words I present to you of Soil Soul Society represent that big vision. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.